Hello. This week, Britain has been saying goodbye to the Queen in so many ways, the very public and the very personal. Tomorrow, at her state funeral, the whole world will. This morning, we'll hear what she meant around the globe after seven decades and seven days of sights and sounds that will echo on. This morning, we'll be joined by two Prime Ministers, New Zealand's Jatinda Ardern and by the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, Sheikh Hasina. Reflecting on his role in the proceedings and the ongoing war in Ukraine, the Chief of the Defence Staff, Sir Tony Radican. And I've been speaking to a man who knew Her Majesty the Queen and the new King Charles III well, the former Secretary of State and now the United States Climate Envoy, John Kerry. We're live on BBC One and on the BBC Around the World this morning. And with me at the desk for the next hour, John Sentamu, the former Archbishop of York, who's been involved in the long planning for the state funeral, Victoria Newton, the editor-in-chief of The Sun newspaper, and Lindsay Hoyle, the Speaker of the House of Commons, who's presided over much of this week's extraordinary ceremony in Westminster. A very warm welcome to you today, and especially to viewers who are joining us on BBC World. Now, this morning, we will talk about the meticulous planning for the state funeral as the nation and countries right around the globe reflect on Her Late Majesty. But let's take a look at the front pages here in the UK. And one picture really dominates. We can see there on almost every newspaper the Queen's grandchildren standing vigil around her coffin. Images that will now be part of the collective memory after such an extraordinary few days. Um, Archbishop Sentamu, you have been talking to the royal family about preparations for this funeral, I think, since 2005. Can you give us a sense of what we can expect? Uh, that service um, arrived on my desk in 2005, as soon as I became a Privy Councillor. Um, the the orders were as far too as the London Bridge and we knew what we were talking about. And that service is constantly being reviewed uh, in consultation um, with, with Sovereign. And I would expect a little tweaking here and there, but for what it has been in the last uh, nearly 17 years, would be the same. So what you're going to expect is the best of 1662 funeral service, the prayer book service. The words which actually were an inspiration uh, to Shakespeare when he came to murder scenes and places like that. So you're going to hear this wonderful, um, you know, English at its best. Also, you're going to hear angelic voices of the choir of the Abbey plus the Chapel's Royal. You really hear voices that are singing to the glory of God. Um, the Queen does not and did not want what you call long, boring services. Did she say that to you? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so you're, going to, you're not going to find boredom, but you're going to be lifted really into glory as you hear the service being sung. So I'm, I'm expecting, because um, I'm going to be there, I'm expecting to hear what I have been reading <laughs> over the last 17 years. So you've been preparing it for such a long time, I mean, nearly 20 years this has gone on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was there before, um, but whenever there are new archbishops, either Canterbury or York, you always get uh, to look at it and have a revision of it. And it's just, I think, I think the, the hearts and people's cockles will be warmed. So, at the same time, there will be a moment of saying, by the way, this is a funeral service, but it's glorious in its setting. OK, 
Okay, so warmth and celebration as well as the sadness. I mean, Victoria, one of the things that I think quite a lot of members of the public have been pleased to see this week are these extraordinary images of Prince William and Prince Harry together. I mean, we can look again at the images of the grandchildren holding vigil yesterday in Westminster Hall. Um, what do you think has been really going on and what do you think it means to people? Well, look, the whole nation um, was delighted to see William and Harry come together when they first uh, went to see some flowers and well wishes. And then this incredible picture last night of the two of them reuniting for their grandmother's sake. Um, it's what they were both very conscious of. I know that both William and Harry wanted to put aside their differences and show that they could uh, do her proud. And I think that's what they've done tremendously. Of course, the public are desperate to know, does this mean there's some kind of reconciliation in the long term? We would hope so, but obviously they've got a lot of private discussions to, to have before that can happen. And can you give us a flavour of any of that that you're aware of or that you've been discussing? I think obviously it's uh, the issue of the book that Prince Harry is writing is, is going to be at the forefront of these discussions. Um, and the royal family are going to want to feel assured that, um, that there's not going to be something too negative in there. So I think that's a real stumbling block at the moment, but hopefully they can move on from it. And as I say, they're both very keen that this doesn't overshadow what is really about the Queen. Now, Mr Speaker, you've been absolutely at the centre of the last few extraordinary days. Parliament itself has been absolutely at the centre of it. What's it been like and what's your role been? It, I'm absolutely busy in the same way that we've been awaiting this moment that you think will never come and when it does arrive it's amazing how the, everybody comes together, Black Rod takes over, the whole of Parliament has functioned well and I've never seen the House as united in its grief as what we've seen when the news came out. It's changed, the atmosphere completely changed. I mean there's normally such clamour and argument and conflict, but we can see here, I mean, you in your ceremonial robes greeting the new king and queen consort there in Westminster Hall. Just what was that like for you? <laughs> it's all been very moving. You've never time to think about things. <laughs> You've just got to be there, get in position. Your biggest worry is being in the right place at the right but time <laughs> and moving with everything. And we all are united in grief, but the grief the family what they're suffering. We saw it with the grandchildren last night. Mm -hmm. We can only imagine, you know, how terrible that news was for them. If it's bad for us, it's so much worse for the family. And when I saw the grandchildren alive last night, William and Harry turned up, and just to see how it brought the family together. You know, the fact that my own grandchildren are with me this weekend just shows, you know, what they were feeling watching them. And I've got to say, it's very moving. And all of us just are so respectful of the way, the dignity that's been shown by the royal family. But of course, as I say, behind that is real grief and the real grief that's brought the country together in the same way. And we've seen the country trying to share in that right. with these thousands upon thousands of people coming to London to queue up for the chance of um, paying their own respects to the Queen. We can look at some of the live pictures there this morning, still thousands and thousands and thousands of people coming to see prepared to spend you know, more than 20 hours in a queue. Um, that's now the scene inside Westminster Hall where people are still filing through for their own chance to have their own moment to pay their individual respects to Her Majesty. People lining up there to do that right now this morning. Now, you will have seen this week so many incredible images of what has been happening in London, not just those thousands of members of the public waiting patiently in line after line, but also members of the military, glimpses of them rehearsing, sometimes under the cover of darkness, part of the preparations for what is set to be such a huge state funeral and a momentous event tomorrow. There are more than 4,000 soldiers involved in putting on the display of respect that will be perhaps one of the biggest moments of the 21st century so far. And the man in charge of that aspect is Sir Tony Radican, who's with us live here in the studio this morning, the Chief of the Defence Staff. Thank you so much for coming in. Good it's morning. such a busy time. Um, the Queen's funeral is a huge and solemn occasion for the armed forces. Can you give us a sense of the scale of this event? Well, good morning, Laura. It's, uh, it's enormous. It's, it's, it's larger than you said. It's actually over 10,000 people in terms of both our soldiers, sailors and aviators. There will be about 6,000 as part of the procession and lining the route, both in London and at Windsor. But it's a, an enormous support effort as well. 
And as you've heard, the planning has been going on for a very long time and we have the plans and now we have to execute them and there's lots of brilliant people that are, that are enabling that and it's a coming together as well. So the Army, the Royal Navy, the Air Force, but also our civil servants and, and, and we're helping other people in London, the emergency services, some of the volunteers as well, uh, so that this is a sombre occasion but it's done with the utmost respect and also the affection that I think is out there and we want to represent the nation. And a um, huge event and so much planning and preparation. And, but are you a little bit nervous about it going smoothly? There's always an element of apprehension, uh, but we have brilliant people that, that help at every level. So some generals that have been planning this for a long time. Um, we have warrant officers and non-commissioned officers that, that look at the precise execution and that's at my level and then all the way down. With, there's, a, there's a wonderful man called the Garrison Sergeant Major, uh, Mr Vernon Stokes, who has, yeah, on Friday, he sort of, and at the rehearsal, has asked the Chiefs to, to, to up their game. Uh, we've all been told to listen to a metronome uh, at 75 beats a minute. So you might see people walking around London so that we get the right rhythm for the, for the funeral procession. And then you've got young soldiers, um, some great stories. There was one, uh, a, a, a young lady who was on a, an aeroplane to go to Cyprus on Thursday. Uh, she heard the news about the Queen's death and she, she held the plane up so she, get, she could get her luggage off. She's a member of the Royal Horse Artillery, Gunner Stark. She got to London and then she could take part in the, in the gun salute that you showed at the beginning of the programme. So there's lots of very moving stories where people are doing their duty and showing their commitment to both Her Majesty the Queen and importantly, His Majesty King Charles. And even one of the members of your many thousands of military staff making you practice marching at the right pace. Absolutely, absolutely. And we need it. And all of us, this is our last duty for Her Majesty the Queen and it's our first prominent duty for His Majesty King Charles. And we're, we're, we're representing the nation. We're representing our mothers, our grandmothers, our fathers, uh, our friends, and everybody's very, very aware of that. You say there, tomorrow's state funeral is the last duty for Her Late Majesty the Queen. You also have been one of the people who gave your own vigil standing by her coffin, and we can see the image of you doing that now in Westminster Hall. What was going through your mind as you stood there? Well, it's a huge honour and privilege. Uh, it's the first time that the Chiefs have done that. And I think there's a, there are a mixture of emotions. The hall, my view of the hall is this sense of respectfulness mm -hmm. that the public coming through and paying their own private respects and, 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 and our contribution to that. And at the heart of it is remembering that there is a, a grieving family. And so there's a solemni solemnity mm -hmm. and a precision about what you're doing. And there's a, a need to concentrate, to stay still for 20 minutes. But then it's also an act of reflection. And my personal mm -hmm. piece was just reflecting on Her Majesty the Queen um, several audiences that I'd been privileged to have with her and, and there's also this sense of gratitude, gratitude for what she provided to mm. our nation uh, and trying to express that with the love and affection that you're seeing throughout the country. And one of the things that she provided to the nation was her decades of experience and she was even a monarch who, who served. Now to the military, how much did that experience that she had herself mean and as the crown passes or has passed to King Charles do you think you will miss her level of experience? So I think there's a there's a personal and professional relationship with mm. Her Majesty the Queen and the whole of the royal family. Her Majesty was was the, the the daughter of a naval officer she married a naval officer she her children were naval officers her grandchildren served in the British Army and the Royal Air Force so there's and, and she served herself but we also have this professional relationship with her as our commander in chief mm. and this extraordinary length of, of her reign and the perspective that that enabled her to give people like me. And I think we're incredibly fortunate with King Charles 
that he also has this perspective gained over the last 50 mm. years and meeting so many international leaders. And that, I think, is what is helpful for people in my role and, and for others at the heads of the service. And you, I believe, met him yesterday. I think he had his first official audience with some military leaders yesterday. Now, I know you won't be allowed to divulge what that conversation was like, but how would you describe um, that, that relationship? How do you think it will work and what does he have to offer, do you think, in that well, regard? So King Charles met with um, all of the heads of the armed forces yesterday. And we're fortunate, he, he knows us all. Mm. We already have a relationship with him. And that was a, an opportunity for us to express our condolences, but also for, in, from my position to express the extraordinary richness of the condolences from mm. chiefs of defense all across the world. And that, I still think, is, even though it, it seems plain to, to, to lots of us. I think when you're the grieving monarch, that still has a richness and is, is quite staggering for His Majesty in terms of what he has seen, in terms of this global response to, to, to Her Majesty's death. And as you say, the military is woven through the royal family's history and, and modern life too. And Prince Harry was allowed to wear his military uniform at the vigil last night, even though he's now not a working royal. But as a member of the armed forces, what does it mean to people who have served to be able to wear, wear the uniform at a time like this? I think it's a, a sense of pride and and it's that expression of having served their country and having served their monarch. And that's what's very, very special. And, and you saw that last night mm. with the Queen's grandchildren. And, and I think you'll see that with the funeral tomorrow, that people will be as proud as punch to be a part of this funeral, but want to do it in such a precise and affectionate way to reflect their allegiance to His Majesty the King and their affection to this amazing Queen that we were fortunate to have. Now, as you've come to see us this morning and join us in the studio, which we're very grateful for, I must also ask you about what's going on in Ukraine briefly. Uh, now, just to remind our audience, we can see in red there areas that the Russians had taken control of. But then look in the last recent days, that purple area, we can see the Ukraine's forces pushing back, taking back territory. What's really going on? Can you explain to us what's happened? I think in many ways we're seeing, we're seeing more of the same. We, at the very outset, we said that this was a strategic error by President Putin. And strategic errors lead to strategic consequences. And in this instance, it's strategic failure. Putin is failing on all of his military strategic objectives. He wanted to subjugate Ukraine. That's not going to happen. He wanted to take control of the capital. We saw that that was defeated earlier on. We saw that he wanted to weaken NATO. NATO is now much stronger, and we have Finland and Sweden joining. He wanted to break the international resolve. Well, actually, that's strengthened over this period. And he's under pressure. His problems are mounting. He's always had a problem in terms of crewing the equipment that he's got. He hasn't got sufficient manpower. His forces are thin on the ground. And we're also seeing a magnificent Ukrainian armed mm. forces who have been courageous, they're fighting for their country, and they've embraced the international support that all of us are providing, and that's now having an effect on the ground. But it's, it's, it's more of the same. At a strategic level, this is a failure for Putin, and Ukraine is fighting to maintain their integrity and to gain more of their country back. And do, do you think this is a turning point that sets Ukraine on a path to a, a victory and Russia losing and Putin potentially losing his power? I think we've got to be very cautious. I think it's significant in terms of what's happening on the ground. It's really significant for Ukrainian morale. It's significant for the impact it has on Russian forces. But people need to be cautious. The likely, the likely result with all of this is that it's going to grind on for a long time. And that's, that's why we, there's a wishfulness when mm. people jump to conclusions that Either President Putin is, is, is weak and his power base might be undermined, um, or that Ukraine has gained some ground and it's been a, a magnificent action in the Northeast, but it doesn't automatically lead on to mm. uh, easy victories elsewhere. You're seeing that in the South with the fight over Kherson. 
do these losses, perhaps they make it more likely that Vladimir Putin might do something almost unthinkable, that he might turn to using tactical nuclear weapons? I think we've got to be very balanced about talk of escalation. Uh, we monitor it very carefully. Mm. We don't see anything at this stage that alarms us. And, and we have to understand that should Putin escalate, there, that creates problems for him as well. So I, again, I would, I would offer caution mm. and, 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 and avoid jumping to conclusions or that something rash is going to happen. So we must take great care then with that, you suggest. When it comes just on a, on a final note, we are seeing in the city of Izium, one of the cities the Ukrainians have taken back, what looks like terrible evidence of war crimes. Can you tell us what you know about what's happened there? And is this evidence of war crimes in your view? So the formal declaration of war crimes needs to be needs to come about from a, a, a more thorough investigation but it's, it's a pattern of behavior this was an illegal invasion of Ukraine at the outset it's 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 illegal to attack civilians the the dam that was that was attacked a few days ago in Korea in, in, in the hometown of Zelensky of, of where President mm -hmm. Zelensky comes from that's an illegal act the attacks on, on the electricity generation, those are illegal acts. What we saw in Bukha are illegal acts. So this is a pattern of behavior and, and, and the international community needs to hold Russia and President Putin to account. Okay, so Tony Radican, we must leave it there. Thank you so much for coming in and we wish you all best for tomorrow's enormous events. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Now, the military has been practicing to be ready for what will be that truly momentous occasion, the state funeral tomorrow. And there are plenty of people to impress. Leaders from right around the world, some 500 dignitaries have flown in from every corner of the globe. And of course, many of them from the Commonwealth, the organization that the Queen believed in, led and promoted. One diplomat told me, everyone wants to come to Her Majesty's funeral because she is one of the family. There is a sense of belonging. Well, one of them is New Zealand's Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, who met the new king yesterday, and she's here with us in the studio this morning. Welcome to you. Thank you very much for coming in. Good morning. What is it like being part of such this massive event? You know, I have to say that my overriding emotion is just how humbling it is because of the sheer scale, but it is so obviously such a historic moment, such a moment in time that so few of us will ever have the opportunity to see and experience. And so I, I feel very privileged um, to be here at all, let alone representing um, New Zealand. And you met the new king yesterday. Mm. What did he say to you, if we can ask? Well, of course, I'll, I'll keep my comments there very, very general because uh, um, we always try to keep in, in close confidence the conversations we're lucky enough to have with His Majesty. But the overriding sentiment was just the gratitude for the great effort that people were putting into coming and paying their respects. And by that, I mean not just leaders, but people. Uh, you could see that um, it meant a huge amount to have seen the sheer scale and outpouring of people's love and affection for Her Late Majesty. And you were part of that. Mm. You went to Westminster Hall to see the lying in state yourself. What was going through your mind at that moment to pay your own tribute, but also to be among these thousands of people who've come to Westminster? The sheer silence of that space uh, is, I think, one of the things that makes it so moving. But alongside that, uh, observing as you do that you're standing there alongside uh, members of the public who, mm -hmm. have, who have queued and waited as much as 20 uh, plus hours to be there to share that same moment that you're having. Amongst everything else, I think the thing that I will take away from, from this, this period uh, is just uh, the, the beauty of the public's response. Um, the kindness that you see um, from members of the public, the patience, the camaraderie, that has been for me the most moving tribute of all has been the public response of the British people. And I know you lived in London once upon a time. Yes. Are you surprised by what you see? You know, you know this country well. Has I it think, taken you? Uh, it doesn't surprise me at all, but I think um, what it does is give me that sense of contrast. You know, I've. Mm. Uh, I've seen what London looks like day to day and what it feels like day to day, the hustle and, and, and bustle, uh, and to see it just stand still, um, but do so so poetically is a very moving thing to witness. But it's also the most fitting tribute I can think of 
the Queen was, um, was here for her people and now her people are there for her. And she was also, you know, there having those very important relationships with leaders like you from around the world. Let's talk about your relationship with the Queen. I mean, you first met her in 2018. Mm. I think we can see a picture of you meeting her for the first time when you were expecting your first child. Quite pregnant. Do yes, you, as you can see. <laughs> do you remember what she said to you then? Oh, I do. I do. I remember. I remember the, con the first conversation that, that we had before um, the uh, reception. We, we had the ability to have a, a conversation between her and myself and my partner, Clark. Um, I asked her, for instance, of course, what was uh, one of the things on my mind alongside being a, a new prime minister was being a prime minister and a mama. When you think about leaders who have been in that position, there was Benazir mm -hmm. Bhutto, there was myself, but before that, there was the Queen. Mm -hmm. And there were so few to look to and so I said to her, how did, you, how did you manage? And I remember she just said, well, you just get on with it. And that was actually probably the best and most, uh, I think, factual advice I could have. You do, you just take every day as it comes and she did. Um, but I have such respect for her because I see now what it takes to be a mum and a leader and she did it more times over than, than I. You've expressed great affection for, for the Queen, um, but in terms of the relationship between our two countries, mm. there were occasionally protests when she visited New Zealand some years ago. And, and you say now that it is inevitable that New Zealand will become a republic in your lifetime. Why do you say that? You know, I think even the Queen herself has a, a observed and acknowledged the evolution over time in our relationships. In fact, when she, when she came uh, to New Zealand several decades ago, she herself acknowledged that the treaty between uh, Indigenous New Zealanders, Māori and the Crown had been imperfectly observed. Mm -hmm. That simple observation is still spoken of today because it demonstrated that she was reflecting back mm -hmm. her observation of the reality and, and um, of uh, New Zealanders' lives. And so uh, my, um, certainly, and this is just simply my observation, my mm -hmm. observation is that there will continue to be an evolution in our relationship. Mm -hmm. I don't um, believe it will, be, uh, it will be quick or soon, but over the course of, of my lifetime. But how then and, and when? Because it's one yeah. thing to say, or it, it, you feel that that's the sense of direction, but how, how and when? And this is one of, I think, for New Zealand, a major consideration, of course, mm -hmm. is because we have complex arrangements. Mm -hmm. The Treaty of Waitangi, a very important founding document for, uh, for Aotearoa New Zealand, signed between Māori and the Crown. These are, this is why uh, it's not a process um, I have any intent of instigating, mm -hmm. but if and when it does occur, it will take time and it will need to be very carefully worked through. Do you understand though why some countries are quite intent on breaking or certainly loosening their ties more quickly than that? That's and quite that, a strong sentiment in some parts of the Commonwealth. I, and I of course am a, an a, simply an observer of that and that will be for each leader in each country to determine their own trajectory, but my observation of the relationship is that that's not necessarily unexpected. Mm -hmm. These are, this is an evolution. And I think what will remain important though is that there will still be bonds between us as Commonwealth nations and there's still things to be gained through those relationships also. Do you think that the Queen's passing will though loosen those links? I mean, she saw so much change, but many of the connections between her and Commonwealth countries were connections that she herself promoted, that she herself encouraged. Do you think her passing weakens that? I can only give an observation from the perspective of New Zealand and that is that a very close affinity and affection for Her Late Majesty. Um, but an observation is that um, King Charles has visited New Zealand as many times. Mm -hmm. He's well known in New Zealand. Uh, he shares many passions and interests that New Zealanders do. Uh, and I think that means that that relationship already exists. It's a transition, but it's not a jarring transition for New Zealand. Now, one of the reasons that you are well known here is that during the COVID pandemic, you took a very hard line on lockdown and indeed closing the borders. I know that the Queen would call you sometimes to talk during the pandemic. I think we can see a photograph of you having a conversation with her during that period. It's interesting across the world and in the UK, some leaders are starting to reassess some of the harsher measures that were used during the pandemic. Have you reassessed the decisions that you made in your approach? 
Well, of course, now in New Zealand, the only uh, restrictions that we have are masks and healthcare and, and a requirement just if you have COVID to stay at home. You know, there will be a period of reflection, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So that means our, our borders are open for any who may have that question in their minds. I think for reflection for leaders around the world will be, how do we prevent pandemics in the future? And what is the, the best response? And we'll go through that process as anyone else will. Um, we have to be willing to look at every decision uh, as, we, as mm -hmm. we go. And we did as we went through the mm -hmm. pandemic. But I still believe we made the best decisions we could with the information we had. We wanted to save lives and the evidence shows we did relative to say a country of the size of Scotland versus New Zealand. Mm. But there were thousands of deaths sadly uh, in New Zealand, 2000. It's interesting, our new Prime Minister though here has said that she would never lock down again. For you, if we end up in a situation which everybody wants to avoid with another pandemic, would a lockdown and border control still be tools that you would consider? Well, I don't see that as the trajectory of this pandemic anymore. Mm -hmm. And so we've said we, we see no scenario in front of us that would lend itself to that. We use lockdowns only as a tool while we waited for our people to be vaccinated mm -hmm. so that we could save lives. And then we began a series of shifts to open ourselves back up again. Mm -hmm. And it's worked. You know, we did save thousands of lives. No response was without pain. I know here in the UK, you had both lockdowns mm -hmm. and lives lost. In New Zealand, relative to other countries, mm -hmm. we were locked down for fewer days and we saved many lives. Well, I'm proud of New Zealand's response. And just finally, as you're here for this enormous event tomorrow with hundreds of other world leaders, um, it's been written that actually this event is so enormous that you're all going to have to take the bus to get there, apart from the American president, Joe Biden. Have you thought about what that's going to be like or, or who you're going to sit next to? Well, I have to be honest, I'm kind of interested that there's so much fuss about it. Because, <laughs> fuss about the bus. <laughs> yes, um, I, don't, I don't think the bus warrants too much fuss. Um, when we came here for Chogham, we used buses for transport back in New Zealand. I, I often get our ministers to carpool in a van. Um, so, uh, look, this just makes good sense. And who do you but want to sit we're next? a very practical people. Uh, who do you want to sit next to? Have you oh, decided? Or will you be told who to sit next to? I'll be sitting next to my partner, Clark. <laughs> OK. All right. Well, just into our day. Thank you so much for coming in this morning and being with us on this special day. Thank, thank you. you. Take good care. Thank you very much indeed. Now, listening to the Prime Minister of New Zealand there was our panel, Victoria Newton, John Sensimu, and the Speaker of the House of Commons, Lindsay Hoyle. Um, Victoria, firstly to you, we had such great affection for the late Queen, but also a pretty clear acknowledgement that the relationship between the monarchy and the rest of the world is going to have to evolve or will evolve. What do you think? That's right, she's talking very clearly about an evolution, not a revolution. Um, it's, it's obvious things won't stay the way they are, but it's also interesting that she said that she doesn't plan to instigate any process. Um, I, and and as, as she points out, that, you know, King Charles, as he now is, um, has been there many, many times. And I'm sure what we're going to see is either the King or the Prince of Wales shooting out to New Zealand and Australia and the realms to shore them up in the short term. Well, we are going to see an extraordinary spectacle with all of these foreign leaders and dignitaries here, the, the most senior in theory among them, President Biden, who arrived here late last night. Um, Lindsay Hoyle, we've seen also a story in the Sunday Times this morning talking about the sort of diplomatic trickiness when you're just simply trying to manage all of these different important people. What, what's that been like? You're, you've been part of the preparations. It's been important to try and make sure we get it right and it's about showing the respect and the dignity and doing it in the right way. And we should not allow anything to overshadow the most important event the world will ever see and that's the funeral of Her Majesty and the passing of Her Majesty has brought people together. So we shouldn't be distracted by others and I think that's the problem that we're seeing and people always want a different story and a different mm -hmm. handle. What I want to do is keep focused. This is about the royal family. This is about their grief. This is about the people of this country coming together to pay their respects. And none more so than yesterday when I had the overseas territories in. Mm -hmm. UK overseas territories, the premiers, the governors, all coming as one together to pay their respects. And it just shows you that the Commonwealth has done the same. These are all the people that will be there at the funeral. But on the other, you know, we, we will not be distracted by the stories. 
I am very focused, will remain focused until Monday and then we will see the politics coming back to the House of Commons then. Mm -hmm. And certainly politics has been suspended pretty much for now, but um, Bishop Sentamu, what do you think it means and the representation of all of these leaders coming in from right around the world, what does that represent? I think it represents that Her Majesty the Queen was very, very successful, first of all, in turning the empire into a commonwealth of nations, 54 of them. So she has actually managed to steer all of these nations so that they become really a, a community of nations that actually work, and, but also not ignoring all of those other countries in the United States that are not in the commonwealth. So the, her greatest legacy is how do you turn an empire into nations of equal status, knowing that she's still going to be the head of the Commonwealth. So will Prince Charles be the head of the Commonwealth? And I think that's the greatest thing. So all of them are wanting to come because they've got this uh, care and love that they have received from the Queen whenever he's visited. I mean, I've been to New Zealand four times, mm. invited by the Archbishop of Australia, New Zealand and Polynesia, uh, Philip Richardson. And what I've seen there, particularly in New Zealand itself, the Maori and all the troubles mm. they had, the way, again, he has managed uh, to say, we have got different histories, but what unites us together, there is only one human race. And because of that, one human race means that we can begin to talk to one another and be with one another. Now, I have no doubt in my mind that Prince Charles III will do the same. But there are, though, some diplomatic tensions, aren't there? Um, and. Mr Speaker, this week one of the things that has been discussed and the Sunday Telegraph has written it about it this morning, um, senior Conservatives like Ian Duncan Smith have expressed anger that um, some Chinese members of the Chinese delegation have been allowed to pay their respects at the lying in state to Her Majesty. Now, you have been, it's been said that you relent on to allow people to come in from the Chinese delegation. Can you clarify exactly what happened? Did that happen? I couldn't say nobody has been leaning on me at all, far from it. My view remains the same, that we would not welcome a reception in Parliament, and that's when I stopped the ambassador and accredited Chinese from coming into the House of Commons. So let's be clear, to hold a reception in the House of Commons when MPs and a peer has been sanctioned is not acceptable. My view remains the same and nothing has changed. But this is not about the politics of the moment. Mm -hmm. This is about the grief that we all share rather than being overshadowed. But as I say, I'll repeat again, the sanction against those accredited officials remains in place and will remain so. There is a very easy answer. Lift the sanction, we can also then look to see whether we should have reception in Parliament but this is not going to happen at the moment. OK, that's very clear. Thank you for that clarification. Now, Victoria, um, by remarkable coincidence, you were with King Charles on his last day as Prince of Wales at his house, Dumfries House in Scotland. We can see a picture of you meeting him there. What, what, what happened and what was that like? Well, it was a long-standing commitment where he'd kindly agreed to film for our Who Cares Wins Awards, where we honour workers in the NHS. And um, he'd agreed to present an award to uh, a doctor who didn't know she was going to win. Mm. Um, and it was really interesting because I've, I've met him a few times now and he was clearly massively under strain. Mm. He wasn't his usual self. Uh, normally he'd be booming around with jokes and fun and he was definitely stressed. Um, but, but, you know, incredibly polite. And what a mark of the man that he didn't cancel any of the arrangements that day. He was working from first thing in the morning, convening meetings. He was doing filming for us, another bit of filming, and he hosted a dinner in the evening. And then, obviously, he didn't know the next, what was going to happen the next day, but uh, he clearly must have known she was unwell, but he still went ahead with all of that, so incredibly impressed. And know, knowing him then through that contact and other contacts, I mean, how do you expect his monarchy might look different? And does it have to evolve, do you think? Um, I'm sure it will evolve naturally. I mean, we, there's going to be a lot of discussion about the slimmed down monarchy, mm -hmm. what that really means and what roles Prince Andrew may or may not have. There's a lot of speculation about that. So I think he'll be clearing that up and, and what happens with other non-working royals. I think the other thing that they're going to massively have to do and look at is leaning into the cost of living mm -hmm. crisis that he takes over as we are going through this incredibly tough time. 
and the, the royal family will need to show her that they're in touch with people and that they care. So when there's questions about the finances of the royal family, I think there's an opportunity for them there to do some really good work. That's an interesting point, John said to me. I mean, right now we can see again thousands of people still pouring to London to try and pay their own tribute um, in these queues. And that certainly suggests that public support has been intense and warm and on a very, very grand scale. But what do you think the lasting effects will be? I mean, as Victoria suggests, lots of people are living in very tough times at the moment. How do you think the royal family will, will com accommodate that or relate to that? Well, Her Majesty, uh, the Queen, as always quoted Churchill, said, the far back you look, the more you are likely to move forward. If you look back to the Second World War, the Queen was herself involved in mending vehicles and all that kind of stuff. The mechanic. To where, to where we've got to now, this country is in a much stronger place, both uh, in England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It is a much stronger, much wealthier country than it was. So I want to suggest that what the Queen has left are really 70 years of dedicated service. And for her, the Christian faith, particularly the example of Jesus, not the religiosity nonsense, but the example of Jesus, modeled her leadership as one of service, as one of duty. We now need to learn from her, as our four nations, that we could do the same. I should look towards my neighbor and try to help and try to support. And not only look at the government to do X mm -hmm. thing, the, again, the words of uh, Kennedy, don't ask what the nation can do for you. Ask what you can do for the nation. This is the question at the moment we've got all to face. What should I do to help people who are in this kind of living crisis? But also sometimes we can overstate things. And the good thing about Her Majesty the Queen, she always understated. Okay. even when great difficulties arose. Okay, thank you all very much for now. Well, there are in this morning's papers some signs of other news returning. There's talk of tax cuts and what the government is going to do about people's energy bills and a story, interestingly, about Liz Truss's chief of staff being involved in an FBI inquiry. Next week, we will be back to the normal thrash of news and we'll be at the Labour Party conference and interviewing Keir Starmer, the party's leader. But this morning, of course, we are concentrating on Her Late Majesty, whose reign spanned decades of such change. Change, she once said, had become the constant. And one of the Commonwealth countries that's seen turbulence and transformation is Bangladesh. Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's father, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, was the founder of independent Bangladesh, but it retained its ties to the UK, with the Queen visiting on several occasions. I spoke to Sheikh Hasina about her memories of the Queen and why the Commonwealth matters so much today. Well, you see, Queen, Her Majesty the Queen, yes, she's Queen of the United Kingdom, no doubt about it, but she was the leader of Commonwealth also. So as a member of Commonwealth country, she has great value to us. And not only that, she, well, about 70 years, she ran the monarch. And I feel in this world, she was not only a queen, but a very affectionate motherly personality. Whenever I met her, I felt that. What are your personal memories of her then? 1961, when she visited within Pakistan, that means East Pakistan, I had the opportunity to see her because we are very young. So uh, in my father's office, we went there because we knew that uh, she was passing through that road. So we, all of us, whole family, we are waiting uh, on the window with a binocular so that we can see her more. When I become prime minister, so I met her every program. I attended about seven uh, communal summit. So every time I had this opportunity to talk to her, meeting her. And also during Olympic game, she invited me, so I came here. That time, very good opportunity. It was for a long time we could discuss. So you met her many times over the decades as a, as a child. 
in your father's office, then as prime minister, and then at many Commonwealth summits. So she was part of your life for many yes. decades. Yeah, and uh, she has a wonderful memory, you know that. Uh, even in Commonwealth summit, even she didn't see me. She used to inquire, where is Hasina? I don't see her. And how important is the Commonwealth to you and to Bangladesh? No, of course, when we are together, there are many opportunities there, so it is uh, good and important that, yes, we have one place where we can exchange our views, we can uh, adapt some ideas, or we can deliver some good job for the country or the people. So that's why I feel it is good. Now, uh, at present, you see, one country cannot go alone. It is interdependent uh, world. So under these circumstances, Commonwealth means a lot for the member countries. Each country, if we can work together, then we can support our downtrodden people. Because there are many countries. There is a developed country, there are developing country, and there is a poor country, uh, uh, small island countries. And your country and the UK have a special relationship. There are many Bangladeshi citizens who come to the UK and made their life here. Um, but the late Queen's High Commissioner to your country called on your government to commit to a free and fair process for next year's elections. Will you commit to that? Look, in my country, we had military ruler for a long time directly or indirectly, overtly or covertly. 1975, when my father was assassinated, he was the president of the country. And you know that my entire family, my mother, my three brothers, two sister-in-laws, and other family members, including 18 members, been killed. But since then, for 21 years, time and again, there were coup d'etat in our country several times, around 20 times, there was the attempt of coup, and so every time there were bloodshed. And there was no democracy, no democratic right. So I struggled for establishing democracy in my country. But there are both the United Listen. Nations and the Queen's Commissioner, the Queen's High Commissioner, did call on your government to commit to a free and fair process. And the United Nations have spoken about allegations of disappearances. Any, many people can place allegation, but how far it is true, you have to judge. Before that, no one should make any comment. So because you, in our country, I told you, that military ruler rule the country. Mm -hmm. They form parties. They never go to the people and ask for vote for them. They use the army, use administration, use everything just to remain in power. Only during Awamilik time, you can see free fair election. And I've, I've heard very clearly that you have committed to those elections being of free course, and fair and course. being in your, in uh, your constitution It, it is today. my struggle. It is my struggle to establish democratic system, free fair election. And will you crack down on groups who've been accused of disappearances? The United Nations have raised concern about things that are going on. Okay, how many people disappear in your country or other country, you can just. All these issues, I think, first you have to take all the information, you collect it, then they can accuse. Final question. Tomorrow's funeral is obviously an enormous global event. What do you think will be in your head as you go to the funeral tomorrow, what will be on your mind? Well, of course, we love Queen. And she was so affectionate. Not only that, I'm lucky that she always remember my name also. I have come here to pay my respect to her. Prime Minister, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Well, the Bangladeshi Prime Minister on her being here to pay her respects tomorrow. Um, Lindsay Hoyle, what will be on your mind tomorrow at the state funeral? Making sure I get my role right. <laughs> and what is your role? Thing. It's just not getting the right outfit on, <laughs> getting down, being there.
for receiving when the royal family come in, but then it'll be leading the royal family out and then ensuring that the coffin leaves and everything goes perfectly well. And I think that's the most traumatic moment is when we see the coffin being pulled by the Royal Navy. I've been watching the practice, this gun carriage that carried Churchill. This will be an amazing thing that people will then, this is the final stage for me and this is the final stage that everybody will remember. And those sights, but also the sounds of that ceremony will be so West, beautiful. Big Ben, the Queen Elizabeth Tower, the bell will be tolling as well, the beats will be there, the Royal Marines and everybody. The huge entourage that will leave will be unbelievable. We'll never see, I don't think we'll ever see the likes of the skin. Go to the Abbey and then it will go back and the crowds will be phenomenal. But as far as I'm concerned, my role in reality ends the moment the Majesty leaves the hall to head to the Abbey. So all I've got to do is get in my seat at Westminster Abbey afterwards. And we think you'll be right there um, at the centre of it all, but we think probably billions of people will be watching around the world. Yes. Victoria, what will be on, on your mind? And um, well, I'll obviously be in the Sun's office working with our superb print and digital staff. And the, the most important thing for us that day is to sum up the, accurately the mood of the nation. How are the nation feeling? And, and reflect that on our front page and on our website. How do you think that will be? How, how will you? Well, extremely sad and, and solemn. Um, I, I mean, the, the, the final scene when we see the, the, the uh, coffin go up in, in Windsor and into the chapel will be quite something. Okay, well it certainly will be an absolutely an event that none of us really have seen the like of before and something that will be remembered and shown again for many, many years to come as people reflect on Her Majesty's role around the world. And the Queen, in her role, was unafraid to raise tricky questions sometimes with world leaders in those quiet diplomatic moments. And her views on the need to tackle climate change and the new King's strong desire to do so were no secret, and that's been vital to others campaigning to that end. Let's hear now from America's climate change envoy and former Secretary of State, John Kerry. I, I really just felt that in every regard throughout her life, she carried herself with this extraordinary dignity. I'm so glad I had a chance to say hello to her in Windsor Castle and have a little chat. I can remember, uh, I was about 10 years old, I guess, and I, I watched you know, the first black and white televisions and saw the coronation. Uh, and my mother was, was, was an Anglophile who had lived in Sussex and Kent. And so she automatically uh, you know, boosted the queen in our presence. Secretary Kerry, do you think this moment could change the kind of diplomatic conversations and the atmosphere that we've been living in? One would hope because there were giants in that period of time in the aftermath of World War II. And you think of Winston Churchill, which I, I think is probably the last funeral uh, of its kind, like the one that is unfolding on Monday. And do you hope the new king will continue to raise climate change in the same way as the queen mentioned it? I, I, I very much hope so. Obviously, in the same way within the, within the constitutional process. But there is no question in my mind that... Uh, that is not a, a, a you know, standard multilateral issue or bilateral issue. It's, it's a, uh, there is a threat to the entire planet, a threat to all of our nations. Uh, and he understands it as well as anybody on the planet. He's been consistently uh, on this issue, uh, beginning in his teenage years and carrying on in many different iterations. And he's for real, believe me. Have you spoken to King Charles this week? Yes, I, I, I did have an opportunity to be able to talk to him while I was in London uh, and very much appreciated his thoughts at that moment in time and was very, uh, very pleased that I was able to express my condolences personally and, uh, and, and the condolences of our, our country. And would you like to see the king attend the next COP climate summit in Egypt and speak in the same strong terms that he did in Glasgow last year? Well, personally, I think that uh, it would be terrific if he was able to do that. And in terms of energy, do you think that Vladimir Putin might turn the gas off this winter? Or maybe this moment's an opportunity to really accelerate the drive for green energy? I think that the lesson is that you, you do not want to be the prisoner 
of your energy source, of your energy base. You don't want to empower people to weaponize energy against you. And indeed, anything is possible, I think, right now. We have to be very hopeful that, that things don't grow worse. But I do know that, the, that Europe as a whole, uh, you know, Ursula von der Leyen and, and Franz Timmermans and, and, and the EU are determined to liberate themselves and also to help advance the process by which we all liberate ourselves from the emissions, which are what are warming the planet. And just lastly, how would you describe Her Late Majesty's role in the curious alchemy of diplomacy? She was straightforward, and I think people appreciated her honesty, but she also had a profound impact on major issues and touched people's lives all around the world, uh, and that is the mark of an extraordinary statesperson. John Kerry, thanks so much. John Kerry speaking to us there about Her Late Majesty. Um, Archbishop, just to close with you this morning, really, you've been intimately involved in planning the funeral. You'll be there tomorrow. What will be on your mind? I think three thoughts. The first comes from my granddaughter, Abigail. When she heard that the Queen had died, she cried uncontrollably and then said, I'll never see another Queen in my lifetime. And then her brother, Mark VI, said, the world has changed. I want to combine those thoughts. I hope it, the world has changed for the better. Secondly, uh, the Queen wrote me a most wonderful letter uh, four weeks after the burial of uh, Prince Philip, thanking me for the flowers, the, the prayers, and then ended by saying, when you are grieving someone you deeply love, it isn't easy when you're having to do it in public. So my thought would be to the new king and the whole royal family. They are grieving publicly and that to find a space to do it. The second thought was when I went to see the queen in 2018 um, to ask permission to step down as archbishop, I went with a huge burden of matters that one day may be revealed. And I knelt down and I said, your majesty, please pray for me. So I put my hands together and she put hers outside mine and we were silent for three minutes. And at the end she said, Amen. When I got up, the burden had lifted. That's the kind of a queen we had. Her life was so rooted in Christ that she was able to transmit that same power, that love, that grace. So I will be saying, Mom, on that day, 12th of July 2018, you lifted my burden, and I'm very thankful. Thank you for sharing such an incredible memory with us this morning, Archbishop Sentiment. It's been a pleasure to have you with us this morning, and indeed a very, very warm thank you to you two also for joining us, Sir Lindsay Hoyle, the Speaker of the House of Commons, and Victoria Newton, the Editor-in-Chief of The Sun newspaper and of course a huge thank you to you for being with me this morning whether you've been watching here at home in the UK or around the world as always you can catch up with anything you missed this morning on the iPlayer and of course you can follow the BBC's coverage of the state funeral tomorrow now usually we would close our conversation on Sunday mornings by trying to make sense of what we've heard over the hour but today we wanted to leave you with something else with this Queen Elizabeth II her late majesty, in her own words. Goodbye. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. God help me to make good my vow and God bless all of you who are willing to share in it. Although that vow was made in my salad days when I was green in judgment, I do not regret nor attract one word of it. In our work and in the way we live, change has become a constant. Managing it has become an expanding discipline. The way we embrace it defines our future. It has sometimes been observed that what leaders do for their people today 
is government and politics. But what they do for the people of tomorrow, that is statesmanship. While we may have more still to endure, better days will return. We will be with our friends again. We will be with our families again. We will meet again.